minutes. <laughs> Who uh, has seen any revisions that we need to make to the minutes? Anybody have anything? Nothing? Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second? Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the minutes of March 8th have been approved. Um, Tara, oh, <clears throat> Tara's gonna send out an announcement or a notice or a new notice, but I've decided we're gonna have our Wednesday meeting um, by Zoom um, just to eliminate any uncertainty that the storm may cause. The uh, the main thing we were gonna do and will do is um, have the town manager in. Um, so he's fine either way. So I'm just, just, we just have it remote. So don't come here on Wednesday. We'll, I'll see you all uh, on Zoom Wednesday night. Um, all right, so we are expecting water bodies to come in at eight-ish. Um, does anyone have any budgets to even start between now and eight o'clock? Anything we can cover? Brian, parking or treasurer? Parking, treasurer, postage, take your pick. You do that, go ahead, Brian. Uh, let's start with the treasurer's budget. I think it's on page, wow. Well, everybody has the book, it's on page 42. This budget is straightforward. There's basically no changes in it whatsoever. Um, the one thing that we did quiz the uh, treasurer on was the advertising expense, which if you look to the actual in the past, um, they are getting much more aggressive this year um, in regards to takings and they have to be advertised. So that's why th that is, it, it's the, been the same, but they haven't actually spent it over the years. Um, In-state travel, same thing. Uh, there's more travel going on as the as COVID is ending. Uh, very, very straightforward. Any questions specifically? Does anyone have any questions on the treasurer's budget? And Madam Chair, are you? Yeah, I'm curious why the um, banking services and charges for both 23 and 24 is so much higher than... They are contractual contracts. At, well, I guess it's contractual, it's a contract. Uh, they're contracts and they are monitored every three years and it's, it's supposed to be going up to that amount. Okay. John, um, so I see that the, the treasurer position is vacant. Is it still vacant? Uh, I don't know if they filled it yet. It was vacant last time I spoke, but they are definitely interviewing for it. They expect it to be filled. Maybe they have an interest. Yes, they do. They do have an interest. Yeah. Seems like kind of an important position. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody could count the money. Yeah. Any other questions on on the treasurer's budget? Anything else, Brian, on the treasurer's budget? No, but that's, uh, these are straightforward. That's why I thought we could get them out of the way. Great. Do you have a motion? Uh, I move that we accept the treasurer's budget as printed uh, with a total of $731,521. Second. Any further discussion or questions? All right. All in favor of um, Brian's motion to approve the treasurer's budget as printed, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, you What else, Brian? Okay, uh, postage. It's on page 46. Um, once again, uh, it's much due about nothing as far as changes go, but the school budget, uh, pardon me, the school postage, which is line 5225, was 
inadvertently in 2022 uh, posted to the school budget, Even it, but the costs were there. Okay. That's why the actual is uh, so dramatically low. Questions? Annie. So does Post Town include posters related to elections? Or is uh, that separate? I don't know what flows through the postage meter, but I, if, if it's a town item, it's included in the post, it's there. Like for instance, the, I don't think it includes the uh, League of Women Voters and things, the mailings you get on that. No, 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 what I meant was like mailing ballots. Yeah. Sophie, do you have anything from the election from our elections budget from our uh, discussion with that government? Yes, all those are okay. in there. So that includes any other questions? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a quick question about the data processing. What is what is that? That's the Pitney Post machine. Oh, okay. So that's just a machine. Yeah. Okay. What? Actually, I don't know if it's pit and close, but I can imagine that it's not. <laughs> and the price is the, it's gone up because I'm sorry. It's gone up because we got a new machine, or it's just it goes up. The rentals go up. It's a rental. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. Motion, Brian. I move that we accept the postage budget as printed, uh, one hundred eighty-eight thousand sixteen dollars. Second. Second. All right, motion made and seconded. Any other discussion or questions on the postage budget? All in favor of approving the postage budget, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that budget too has to pass And I need to pull up my parking budget, which maybe we can get printed, so I'll go to the book. Eight sixty five. Okay. Um, this budget, uh, the printing is the cost of tickets. And the contract, actually, I don't have that. Contract service. Oh, that's, I have down here for um, scanning, for scanning items. Five thousand, and, they, and they, again, the parking budget in general has been lower because of COVID. Everything, they're expecting everything to come back um, to higher levels. And when we get to the parking district budget, you'll see that more dramatically, which I'll do, which we'll do after. Um, the offset is to the police department um, for the, I believe it's a half, half of the, the parking officer. Any questions? Yeah, um, so there's only one person listed here, but don't we have any parking, like officers going around and enforcing the parking? Are they in the police budget? They're part in the police budget, part here. And then I believe when we get to the, um, it's parking actually gets, it actually gets funded, I believe, in the um, parking district budget. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's the same question. In the old days, we used to pass them out. In the old days, right? I still, I, when we get there, I will. Al Jones. So, I don't know if it, with this budget or the next budget, the parking district budget, but there's a whole turnover of meters or programs yes. and replacing them. Yes, about it's in the next budget. And it, so it's it's funding itself from the parking fees. This this comes out of the town budget. Peggy, so I have a question. I, I'm just curious why the um, Tinlin salary goes down in 2024. 
I actually just looked this up. Okay. Go ahead, Sophie. And I just looked at the prior year's book. There was a previous. That's not who was in that position mm -hmm. last year. Uh, I just forgot to put in the name of the previous person because I have the same question. Thank you. You're welcome. You want anything else you want to answer? <laughs> So it was it was Mun Munzy M U N S E Y that was able. Yeah, she's right. right. <laughs> like three years late. <laughs> Laura Munzy. Any other questions on the part of the human services? Of the John. Yeah. yeah. So so there's no revenue on this bike. All the revenue is on the other bike. Correct. <laughs> And it looks like the total revenue is 416k, right? 416. Uh, well, I'll get there. Yeah. Uh, this year is expected to be, this year, 2023 is expected to be 295. Next year, they expect to rise back up. Yeah. And then, but so to get that 416k, you, you combine all the expenses, like, so for instance, the 280k, that's the expense on this side, 280k plus the, um, what? Yeah, but we'll, we'll do yeah, we'll, let's, let's we'll, wait. We'll we'll just, I was just going to compare that. <coughs> it seems like it's pretty close. If, you, if you're okay with the we have to discuss that. I have no questions. There's questions on the parking right. budget on page 66. All right, do you have a motion, Brian? I move that we accept the parking budget as printed in the amount of $54,280. Second. All right, any further discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. All right. Well, I don't need to do this. I guess I don't have, need to pass this around, right? Does anyone need a copy? <laughs> is this the parking two people. fund budget? <laughs> this is the parking fund budget, okay. right? Here, just there's three there. Short down. <laughs> <laughs> Who ordered okay, sewer that you got to get past us because you have to look to the next one? Do you need to know the other one? Do you need to know the Okay. Okay. Uh, parking fund budget. Um, in the past couple of years, this has been, I'll say, not quite decimated, but um, substantially lower than it was prior to COVID. And the original numbers that they we're expecting in 2020, 2019 was probably about 550,000 in revenues. And it's just gone down from there. Um, they do have money in their fund. Uh, if you look at the very bottom, that's the balance, 526,000 is the amount in their actual fund at the beginning of the current year. Um, and then, so if you go look, look at the actuals, they're not so great. But what they did was um, they did not spend a lot. They will be spending more in the springtime. So if you look to the column all the way to the left where it says projected FY23, that's what they do expect to spend at, by the end of the year. So they're going to eat into their budget by about $230,000. <clears> pardon me, into their cash mm -hmm. by about $230,000. Going forward, they expect better revenues and um they hopefully are going to replace a lot of the meters um i'm not sure it, it, to the exact timing of it they but a lot of the meters just are are turned off okay. yeah yeah but they're, they're they're expecting to to fix them. so we're not getting any any revenue right, right. so they're expecting to fix all that but it's fixed or replaced? I, I, I think it's going to be replaced. Okay. That was my understanding. Does that include the multi space ones? No, I think the multi space meters, so like for a change, the only ones that are working. <laughs> it used to be there were the ones that weren't. Fascinating. Sophie, do we know what, what happened to all these meters? Um, I believe a lot of it was the a 4G, uh, 3G getting turned off. If I'm not mistaken, that was the that the is, main problem. Yeah, that dead batteries. Yeah. yeah you can put a battery in something that doesn't work, it still doesn't work. <laughs> and they and they brought back the parking meters. They didn't buy new meters. They bought used meters. So the used meters just died. Uh, <clears throat> oh, 
How much is the decline in revenue because of that and not COVID? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. How much of the decline in revenue is because of? I don't know. We did, 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 we didn't discuss that specifically. Um, I could find out. Um, I'm not sure that they're expecting towards more because they're it, it, they're waiting for businesses to recover. And if you look on Mass Ave, there's still a lot of empty storefronts and things like that going on. So I think you know as the as the economy comes back and more stores open up, I think it will turn around to some degree. But um, I can I can ask certainly. Any other questions, Grant? Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure, perhaps you're not either, but wasn't this sort of moratorium on parking? There, there was. It, 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 no, it, it, it ended, I think it ended at like at the end of 2021, or in the middle of 2021. It was, it was, it was that way for at least a year. No, this is just recent, recent broken years. Oh, because, oh, because of broken years. Declared. I'm sorry, I thought you were talking because of COVID. No, this is the broken meters, and I don't know. Oh, I, 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 I don't know. I will be happy to ask. And just the being replaced is what we got on the calendar. Well, the, the, yeah, the, this, I was looking at next year's budget, not this year's. That's why I was looking at the projection for this year being so bad. Mm. Right. Well, if there's no notorious, if, if, I, don't I don't know. know I, I don't know of a moratorium. I don't know. I will be happy to inquire about that. Well, are we collecting revenues now? I believe we are collecting revenues now. Okay, thank you. Hey, John, you Madam Chair. So, uh, I guess specifically the big lot, uh, I think you have Bedford Street coming down right behind St. Anthony, that huge lot. Yeah. There's like one little place to pay in the middle of it. Uh, so, where would that revenue, would that revenue be a multi space? Multi, yes. So, that's 139K. So, I guess I have just a question. So, is the purpose of that revenue? To, you know, is it a revenue generation, like you know, to, to get that 139k, or is it mostly just to keep people from parking there all day long? Or is it a combination? Is are you answering that? I'm not answering. Okay, go. You might ask. So, so this was a big debate when they when we were doing this a number of years ago, and David and I were both of the mentality that parking meters are to get people to move; they are not to generate revenue. However, lots of people in town and, and in town roles feel that it's for generating revenue. Um, in a multi-use like that one, if you can park all day, then sure, it's for generating revenue. You can park for eight hours yeah. or, or nine or 10 for commuting. But if it's on the street, it's for the businesses to get turnover on the street. You don't want people you don't want people and to improve the area around it. It's, it's, yes, because so which the will then bring more people in. May I suggest we ask Sandy this when we have the, the opportunity, same as the parking. And yeah. it's nice to hear a pine. Yeah, that's right. I see well, the real reason. You will be in on on Wednesday, John. Do you have any other questions? No, that was helpful. Thank you, Dave. And then yeah, Charlie. Just one comment. Going back to the um, there was a moratorium on uh, on the, the parking meters during the construction in Arlington Center. That went on for a while, for quite a while until that all that construction was completed. But they were not using the, the uh, parking meters, and that's over now. All right, Charlie, and then Jennifer. Uh, yes, just on this question of whether it's used for uh, moving, you know, keeping people moving or for collecting revenue, <clears throat> the town adopted some legislation about five years ago um, that created. <clears throat> parking fund and that collects the money that's paid into these meters and it has to be used for specific purposes in the area where it's collected and that was a deal between the town well the state has the legislation but uh, the town and the uh, the merchants in that area so the projects that are some probably some projects here somewhere i don't know um yeah, I guess uh, ben, the parking benefit district is what it's called, and these are projects that um, the, the town undertakes to improve that area from the money that's collected from the meters. Yep, thanks. Yeah, you can see them listed. The seasonal mm -hmm. decorations. Yep. And they've expanded it as well. See the yeah. Chestnut Street safety improvements. 
Yeah, that, that they added Chestnut Street to the parking district. It wasn't there um, in prior years. The traffic light. So they are expanding and doing it. Yeah. Jennifer. Oh, I just wanted to thank you, Madam Chair, uh, to read what we got in our notice, which was um, beginning of February, said that the policy of um, no parking, no no metering because the parking needs to be replaced was going to be into effect until March 31st. It was a two month period. Um, and this plan for the meters were approaching their end of the useful life, scheduled to be replaced in late 2022, but um, because of COVID supply issues, we're not, not replaced until now. So it doesn't sound like something went wrong, but more, you know, as Tom said, it's that there's just sort of, of you know, left, they were, they need to be replaced. Yeah. yeah. Grant and then Al Jones. Oh, um, thank you for that clarity. There's a number of more moratoriums. And so it is, in fact, still in effect. Mm -hmm. okay. there, yeah. This so particular Until the end of March, the current business. Yes. So in connecting with what Charlie mentioned, um, and, and this isn't the high finance, but how do they account? Um, I mean, so that's a particular parking area that's affected, benefit area that's affected. Are they the ones taking the hit for not using the meetings and meters? And also, um, how are the meters really spread out? I mean, are they not just in one location? The old meters might. And so the parking moratorium also includes meters that are working. No. So there's no, or do, uh, we are. When I parked recently, they've taken out the mechanism. Yeah, they literally shut they off. Just, the they, took the, they took our piece So no just... revenue from any meter from February to March. Is that accurate? I don't think Some that's meters. correct. Because I think the, the ones in the lots, oh, the yeah. multi-lot right. meters, are still yes. in effect. Yes. Right. Oh, okay. I meant, okay, that's that's a yes. different station. That's this is a sandy question. I don't know how much it is. Or the question is how do we allocate it? How is it being allocated if it is? And uh, that was the question I would have about the current moratorium and about which meters were affected. And I'll um if wait they're for in sandy. the parking if they're in the parking district, the town does not get the right period. Right, but the parking I'm district just, does. Parking district the does. parking district does. So how do you know which parking district is being affected by all these different parking meters? There's only one. It's all one parking benefit district. Um, well, that's great. Um, I think it's, an, I'd like to hear that verified by Sandy because it's um, which parking benefit area? Center. Only the center area, okay. Sophie, did you have your hand up? No, I, just, I guess that was my question too. Is is it just the center on the moratorium, or because I know the meters are working by the post office, for example? Oh, so it says um, meters located on Mass Avenue between Franklin Street and Jason Mill Street, Broadway between Franklin and Webster, Broadway Plaza, Alton Street between Broadway and Belton, Medford Street, Higgs Bend Way, and Court Street. That sounds pretty. Well, common. most of it is, is most of it is in um, Arlington Center, but some yeah. of that is. Further north, maybe there, it's possible they're doing some sort of rolling thing for mm -hmm. because some are still. I mean, yeah. yeah, I was at the post office one, and they were it was working. I mean, I was able to hit the fifteen that, minutes. And that's Court Street, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that's a question for Sandy. What's going on? When is it going to end? Um, well, how's the allocation? More the question I have more about is the allocation. Who's some somebody getting hurt because their meters? That's it's only it's only it's only the district. That's who's getting hurt. Look at this whole budget. This is all the improvements being made within the parking district, which includes, uh, as, if I understand it correctly, right, it includes everywhere that the yes. parking meters exist. It's all the business districts that are metered. And this was reviewed as of March 3rd. Yeah. So, so it's this not, is this not an old document. This is what they are proposing. So in our projected FY, the, the spending. Sure, right. Is the proposed benefits to those businesses? No, I understand it's a current right. The yeah. budget, but all goes away when the meters get fixed. I understand. I still think you're that Sandy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, you no, know, I'm, I'm trying to. I've been trying to encourage. Carolyn, this Al. Uh, two questions about the charging stations. Um, one is there an expense related to those and. and B is why is the FY24 projection so low? I missed that. Um, I'm not even sure where that is. No, no. Where the charging oh, station charging is. Oh. Um, I assume that, I assume oh, that there, there was one, one, there's supposed to be one over one the Russell lot. There's, there's but, a couple, I think. But the Russell lot uh, hasn't been, there, was, uh, there hasn't been access to 
for a while, unless in the last two months. Okay. They, well, I know the one by, by the old Dallas Library, by yeah. UCLA is yeah. cooperative. Yeah. There's one, right, 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 one off of Water Street. So. Are municipal town, charging town stations town. going away? Or? Well, the town hall belongs to the, uh, to, to the town manager. Okay. Are, are they going away? Or? No, I don't think they're going away, I'm, but it, there is a cost to them. And the cost is the, is the energy. I do know that. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious then uh, where we're, that we're is. We're paying a bundle for the, to get the parking meter nickels collected. I would think there'd be a lot of bundle collecting the money from the church. Unless but anyway, yeah, yeah. Those, are, those are my two questions. No, I, ha I have to ask um, I'm Julie Wayman, but said he's going to be here on sun uh, Sunday, on Wednesday. Yeah. <clears throat> Alan, there you are. The charging stations when you pay, yeah. it, it pays for the electricity to charge the car and it pays for the parking for to park there. Right. So I'm assuming the treasurer divides it up. The electricity goes to charge point, which operates the things, and the money goes to the parking fund. Mm -hmm. And then and charge point covers all the expenses? I, I would assume I mean, they get the they get the profit, they okay. get they cover the expenses. And and can you have any idea why the projection would be so low this year? No. Annie, did you have a hand up? No, no. Carol. Yeah. Um, there is another parking station with, I think, three units behind the Bank of Boston, Bank of America, um, across from the library. And that is active all Sunday morning whenever I am um, across the street at the Union Church. Yeah, but I'm not sure those are ours because it's a private parking lot there. Oh, never mind. Uh, there is, they oh, there they is give it one. to the town or they rent it. Wait, to which town. one are we talking about? There's right. three in the Bank of America parking lot, and then there's two right when you come in from Water Street. Is that right, David? Is that, right. Is that right. In from Water Street. There's two right there, but there's another <laughs> street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still with the Whole Foods. I'm sure we have another one with that. On the other yeah. side, yeah. Right. we have the Unitarian yeah. Church. It's the meters. I don't think the meters. town has. Owns no, I don't. I think there's a lot of charging stations around the town doesn't own. Right. So, you know, yeah. if it's not on a public street, I don't think it's ours. No. Yeah, so two on, it's the Water Street and the, the town lot. Yeah. One of each, well, two. There's, there's two Station. by the old by the ACMR. There's two by the ACMR. The, by the Bank of America behind there? No, ACMI. No, ACMI, the old Dallas. Park Avenue. Park Avenue. Oh, right, that's Avenue. town. That would be the same thing as the Water busy. Street, except there's no charge for parking. Alan, after you have to tell me where they are because I just got a new electric car. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Grant. Uh, I noticed this seasonal decorations is going to project to be 50K. Don't you want Christmas lights? Is that what they are? And they, 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 put, they put up all of them. To the things for the seasons, you see the banners and stuff like that. And they haven't in the past. I don't know where the where this budget should. was in the past, but maybe they just absorbed it. I think that's you what have any, yeah, that's a big plan. Yeah, that's fifteen thousand in our in yeah. Yeah. works. Public Works has, has a, a historically fifteen thousand every year. So I don't know if this this is much more. So replacing lights might make sense rather than just the cost of operating them. I don't know. I uh, that, I, I move like to that. ask Sandy this question as well. Uh, sounds to me like we ought to postpone. Yes, yeah, just postpone to Wednesday. Wednesday. Are there any other questions that maybe we can answer without having to wait for the rest to be answered by the town manager? Charlie? Yes. Uh, what's the line item of our our lot blue bike station? Probably. Yeah. Well, it's no money. In those prior years. That she just didn't pull it out, obviously. The budget. It's so, not, is there a blue bike station? There, I think there used to be. But it's not in this budget. Either. Okay. Thank you. We're just not asking for money. All right. Anything, anything else? All right, we'll hold off on this budget until we meet with the town manager on Wednesday, but then we'll take a vote on Wednesday. Um, anything else you have, Brian? That's it, that's all I got. All right. Come on in. Make yourself
Water bodies, people. Hello. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. I'm David White, Susan Shapnick from Conservation Mission, David Morgan, our agent, uh, Brad Barber, Brad Chuck Charoni. Chuck I'll start off here and then we'll introduce people along the way. Okay. Huntington has many water bodies. Spy Pond, Hills Pond, the Reservoir, the Pond of the Park, Little Brook, the Mystic River, the Lake, and the Midway Brook. Some of these are the sole responsibility of the town of Arlington. Others are shared with other agencies, such as the Mystic Lake and the Mystic River are basically DCR's yeah, responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this request is to provide funding for the care of the water bodies that Arlington has a primary responsibility for. That's only some of them, but there's still a good number. The state, the DCR, is primary responsibility for the Mystic River, Mystic Lakes, and their life work. So we work with them, but we're not responsible for those water bodies. I'm going to go in sequence here at the report. The first one I'm going to talk about is the Arlington Reservoir. This is a town swing beach and a much larger open water space as well with natural areas, birds, other wildlife. It's a major attraction now for many people year round. The basic problem of the reservoir waters are the invasive water chestnut plants that can totally cover the water in the summer. This is a long-term problem and the basic approach is to harvest these mechanically in the early summer and remove, reduce the seed bank. But the seeds can last for 10 years, so it's a long-term problem. I also note that volunteers also participate in the water chestnut collection, and they do it basically along the shoreline where the machines can't reach. Okay, um, next is Hill's Pond. David's going to talk about that. So at Hills Ponds, which is found in Monogamy Rocks Park, we have one of the locations of Arlington's relatively highest ecological integrity. It's a beautiful spot. I'm sure many of you have been there. Over the course of the past year, we saw that location be enhanced in terms of its ecological health. We hired Water and Wetlands, a great consultancy firm, made five site visits to Hills Pond, 
they treated with algaecide and uh, did some invasive species management uh, treatment in Hills Pond on, uh, I guess it was three visits and they did a pre and a post survey and found that by and large their efforts were successful. Unfortunately, as you remember last year, we had a drought, a lot of high temperature days and the confluence of these problems led to a algal outbloom or bloom rather <laughs> outbreak in Hills Pond towards the end of the year. So when that happens, the state shuts everything down. We're not allowed to get back in there and treat anything until the harmful toxins have been released from the algae and everything's copacetic again, which did eventually happen. Um, the focus for next year is to do regular testing for cyanobacteria. Those are the to toxins that are in harmful algal blooms and uh, also to do better maintenance, including the, the buffer strip around uh, the pond to make sure that fewer of the contaminants, the runoff and fertilizer and the likes get into those ponds to further prevent problems. Good. This one is Mill Brook. Mill Brook is a mostly channelized and it serves as the primary storm drain for the heights. But there are some natural areas along the brook. And the Conservation Commission has applied the CPA funding to restore the wooded area between Herd Field and the reservoir as ongoing in this coming year. McLennan Park. Back to me for McLennan. <laughs> so McLennan is an interesting case. We built it a number of years ago, detention ponds to deal with some of the flooding up there. Um, in the past year, we've gone over the plans for McLennan, looked at what was originally designed and how it's performing currently. I was contacted by residents, asked me to come out and speak with them about flooding. They're concerned that the ponds are filling up with sediment. And we'll need to go back to the drawing board in order to figure out whether that is true. The initial maintenance, however many years ago, was never performed. And so that needs to be reestablished. I will be working on that in the planning department as that was delegated to planning many, many years ago. And I'll essentially reestablish that baseline for CONCOM to manage moving forward. There is also a buffer strip that was established in 2020 around uh, the detention ponds per the agreement of DPW Recreation and the Conservation Commission. Unfortunately, contractors went in and mowed that down in the past year. So we need to reestablish detention ponds, uh, buffer zones, and establish no mow area signage in order to keep that pond in good health. Okay, thank you. Um, Spy Pond, I think, is next. Okay. Right. Yes, I'm, I'm Brant Arbor. I'm with the Spy Pond Committee, which is part of Envision Arlington. And uh, I'm also uh, in representing the main groups in Spy Pond or Friends of Spy Pond Park, which many of you have visited. Um, the Arlington Land Trust, who own, uh, part, most, own most of Elizabeth Island, Boys and Girls Club, uh, Arlington Belmont Crew which is one of the main users and all the fishermen and everybody who enjoys it. So um, we had an interesting, a good year last year. Um, it was actually fairly quiet because we're switching providers. So the new, um, we're not using solitude like management anymore. We're now using uh, SWCA uh, out of Amherst. Uh, they were, did a big study for us uh, last year, uh, two, two years ago, which we talked about the last time that we came here and found significant problems with spy pond and the management of it. And, um, and we're now sort of the main event. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we, we finished the spy pond notice of intent. So permitting issues, really, there wasn't much done in the way of, of dealing with problems. But those permitting issues are now over. Um, and we have a notice of intent. and. The big change is instead of waiting for problems to become perfectly obvious, uh, for instance, when the pond gets choked up with, with excessive vegetation, um, 
we'll be treating if if we'll be dealing with stuff when it's when it's like a foot foot or two high instead of four or six feet high, and that will both minimize the need to how much herbicide is used, and it will also um, uh, it will also reduce the amount of sediment growth, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, the two, the big ones we did was one of the big events that involved half of Arlington is we distributed fertilizer flyers. Um, if you were on this side, of, well, I guess the other side of Mass Ave, between Mass Ave and Route 2, we, we delivered to almost every household in the area. 6,500 6, flyers were distributed by the high school, by, by the committees, by neighbors, by Boy Scouts. It was a very successful project. We'll be doing about half of the, the other, we'll do doing another quarter of Arlington this year, and we'll be doing the last quarter the year following. Um, and why is that important? Oh, it's important. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's important because actually something new has happened, is if you go into a hardware store now, most of the fertilizers that you find for established lawns have zero phosphorus. And we know about the problems of phosphorus because you remember two years ago, we had those massive rainstorms when the hurricanes came through. They, they basically washed clean the whole watershed. And just there was just tons of water coming in. And with that came sediment. And attached to the sediment was all the phosphorus that people have been putting on their lawns. And now it's it's now it's it's easy to treat with zero phosphorus, and that's what we're trying to encourage. And it was a, a quite a successful project. Um, we've also been doing um, uh, more studies of Spipon. We kept basically biweekly um, a review of the uh, plant growing plant and algae that was growing in Spipon. Um, I, a, a pet project of mine is I'm starting to study the sediment depth. So there's areas, my deepest one so far is 13 feet of sediment with, with five feet of water on top of it. So, so that sill behind, uh, behind, the, behind the island is the, um, it's really a sediment lake. It's not a water lake. There's more sediment underneath, underneath the, uh, the surface and there is, and that's the sediment is what's giving the substrate for the aquatic plants to grow. Uh, so the one, one of the big worries we have, well, the big success, the other big success, of course, is Spy Pond Park. They've done a major effort to build on their successes in previous years. So the shoreline has been beautifully restored. They've maintained those plantings. Um, they've worked on, uh, We've, we've done a project to get rid of invasives on there, and there's a new playground going in place. And so, I'm, I'm, and they have work crews every month going out, keeping it really nice. So that's a, that's a big win for SpyPod. Um, so I think that's, that's it. I guess I, I would like to say the, the biggest concern, and we just don't know, you know what it is. Our biggest concern is we've got some new invasives on SpyPod, uh, in particular, uh, variable leaf, variable milfoil, which is a cousin of Eurasian water milfoil. And, um, and we also have this uh, problem with curly leaf pondweed. The curly leaf pondweed, it's very clear the way to treat, to deal with that is you treat it very early in the season before anything else is growing and you keep it under control because if you don't keep it under control, it locks up the pond um, in through June when it naturally dies. So I think that's it. I'll have, I have um, a few copies of our annual report from the Spy Pond Committee and also the Friends of Spy Pond Park accomplishments. I'll just leave it up here and if you'd like to, it's not, it's, I don't think it needs to go in the record, but just if you'd like a copy, you're welcome to pick one of that. Yeah. Don't worry, Brooke. Just in case that way, Brooke is actually a responsibility of DCR. It runs along Arlington's eastern border. There are a number of problems present to Arlington. One problem is that there's combined two overflow outlets in the Red Brook. And we discharge 
impacted people with Halloween. Currently, there's an ongoing process with the Massachusetts DEP to develop a new long term control plan for the CSOs along the Empire. And the select board and the Save Your Life book people are involved in that process trying to close the CSOs that still remain in the Empire book. We also received through David Rogers a grant from DCR for green infrastructure systems. It's basically going to build a system on Magnolia Street for this DCR grant. Um, we're also contacting legislators trying to get some more funds for state study, what can be done with the Empire Brook. There's a lot of things going on, but not much talent and money involved in that. Um, Hi, I'm Susan Chapnick. I'm the chair of the Arlington Conservation Commission. Sorry, we didn't totally introduce ourselves before. And Chuck Taroni is the vice chair. So um, if you have any questions after, any one of us can hopefully answer them. I'm going to talk a bit about the Mystic River. Um, the Mystic River water quality has a rating of B plus according to EPA and the Mystic River Watershed Association. That water quality um, rating is based on bacteria. Um, not on chemicals or the health of the fish, just FYI. Not too bad, but not as good as the Upper Mystic Lakes, which are A. The, over the years, the Arlington's Department of, Part of Public Works has taken a watershed view of uh, Mystic River um, and has promoted installing green infrastructure, such as rain gardens and infiltration trenches, which there's a, a nice little figure in, in our report to show how many of them were installed last year. The um, work that's managed by DPW is funded mainly by um, coastal pollution remediation grants from the Office of Coastal Zone Management. However, last year actually we, we received um, financing from federal non-point source grants. And also in the Mystic River, as you may remember in several years I've been coming here, uh, discussing the restoration of the area on the Mystic where we had an oil tanker that overturned um, back in, well, I think that might've been 2015, 2013, 2015, a long time ago now. Um, we, we won a grant for restoring that area and besides just restoring a riparian habitat, riparian means right next to the river, we also um, took the opportunity to improve the water quality in the area by fixing a broken head wall um, from an outfall there and also partnering with DPW to install some um, better infiltration upstream of where the water is coming down across Mystic Valley Parkway into this oh. area. Um, the project received a certificate of compliance from the Conservation Commission last year, meaning that it was installed and maintained as permitted. The challenge now is to keep um, this restoration healthy by controlling the invasive plants that come in there. Um, and we have an agreement with EPW to do just that. In uh, starting this year, Arlington hosted its first uh, public meeting to discuss connection between the Minuteman Bikeway and the bike path along the Mystic River, and why is this important to conservation versus just transportation. Um, the reason it is is because we have an opportunity for enhancements along this area, like reduction in impervious surfaces um, while this project is getting developed. There are some um, recommendations that we'd like to make for work on the Mystic Riverfront area. Um, additional uh, measures to improve stormwater runoff. There's a lot of runoff from the Mystic um, Valley Parkway, as you might expect. This runoff can contain a lot of <coughs> chemicals that are harmful to aquatic organisms. And also, we'd like to investigate opportunities um, for, for restoring degrading conditions at other town-owned shoreline outfalls. Now, this may come as news to some of you, but we most of the outfalls are DPWs along the Mystic River in Arlington. But there's three more that belong to the town, and they are also broken and degraded. They are not working as they should. The water that's coming out of there 
um, is, is basically just polluted the air flowing right into the river and polluting it. So um, it would be great to look at those just like we did at the Mystic Riverfront restoration um, and see if we can improve that area. Okay, thank you, Susan. Yep. There's a lot to do, but people are working on things. This particular budget tonight is for part of the work that requires us to hire outside contractors to do the work. So this is the budget is going to focus on part of what we do. But is David going to review the budget or yeah, David's it's, going to, it's behind you? David's going to do the budget, yes. Yeah. So David, present the budget. And I don't know if you can see. I'll move that. I'll move that. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. So per uh, last year's agreement, we went for uh, $15,000 in funding in FY23. We were looking to spend down the amount that we had in reserves at that time. So we managed to spend, I think, uh, roughly, oh, we, we got it down to about $60,000. From I believe it was one fourteen there. Yep, one fourteen. Yes, uh, thirty five of that went to uh, Spy Pond. That's the work that Brad summarized for us. Um, we had twenty six thousand at the reservoir, and I, I want to put a pin in that expense because I'm going to come back to it in just a moment. Just remember how much we're spending at the rest. That's for the water chestnut harvesting exclusively. Uh, expenses at Hills came in less than what we anticipated. That's because of the algal bloom that I mentioned that shut down our operations there towards the end of the year. And we incurred just $35 in other expenses. It was uh, some printing costs, nothing of any significance. So in the future, uh, we'll revert to this being FY24, we'll revert to the $50,000 funding level per usual. Uh, we're looking at pretty much level funding across the board. We've allocated 5,000 for McLennan to start to sort out those issues that I was talking about. As I said, those are mostly gonna live in the planning department and not be a CONCOM expense, water bodies working group expense, but we have the money set aside in the eventuality that something does need to be take, taken care of. And now I'm gonna come back to the expenses at the reservoir. We have a contract it's sitting on Doug Heim Legal Counsel's desk right now for, to be signed for a new contract with a service provider for water chestnut removal at the res. We were told by our old contractor that they would essentially double the price. And so we had to go out and find a new one. Um, we were very fortunate in that we found the one other operation in New England that does this kind of work. And he had just purchased his harvester. Oh, so <laughs> we we squeaked by. Um, wow. Yeah, we got on the ground floor of that operation. They seem like a wonderful service provider uh, recommended by our uh, folks that take care of Hills Ponds and Spy Pond, Water and Wetlands, who I have full faith in. I, I very much trust this is gonna go well for us. Also timely. Very time, yes, and we're gonna get on that issue much sooner this year as a result. We have the, the contract in hand, no, none of the hangups of last year's delays. I want to underscore though, how much we are spending on the res every year and that that is an avoidable cost. We had initially proposed to CPA this year for a, a aquatic harvester for the town to own ourselves, the cost of which would be about $100,000. Over the course of three, four years, we'll have paid for that harvester just out of the regular cost of doing business, let alone if you know, costs do go up like the other service provider had said that would happen. So I, I wanna offer that for your consideration in the future. We're not making any requests to that end here today, but I want you to have that information and be able to deliberate on it. FY25 looks much the same, but um, shall we go to questions? Sure. I am going to exercise my prerogative as chair to start the questions. Okay. Um, the res, 
I am concerned about the other invasives. For example, I know um, milfoil is spread by fragments. So are we not making that worse by pulling and harvesting the water chestnuts? And what's, what's the plan to control the other invasives? Well, we have the order of conditions now that specifies manual removal can be conducted at the res and at spy pond. So those methods are definitely preferable compared with the harvester. Milfoil, and I need your backup on this I one. Can, I can talk. I don't sure. think it's in, is, the, is it in the rest Milfoil? Is milfoil in the rest? Mm, so. you speak louder, please? Well, we had problems on milfoil in spy pond. We yeah. actually eradicated it there right. from all reports. Mm -hmm. um, there may well be milfoil in the res. I don't know. We I, haven't I, identified it. We haven't identified it. No. But even if there is milfoil, I talked with um, Steve Johnson, who's who's the senior one of the senior people at SWCA. He did the surveys. He spent two and a half days here on spy pond, and um, his comment was especially in a place like the res, which is small and contained. If you have water mill foil, it's going to be everywhere. So fragmenting it more is not going to make a difference. Um, it is a concern if, you, if you're like on a big lake and you just got a little area, you don't want it to spread further. So that's like the issue that we have with, with, with water mill foil, with the um, variable mill foil. It's currently in a small area and we don't want it to spread further. So we will be minimizing our, 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 our you know, <laughs> disturbance of that, of that. Plant. But that's spy pond. That's spy pond. Not the rest yeah. of the well, Does that answer that. your question? I'm looking at your report. On page three, mm -hmm. you have the, you, you cite the 2020 aquatic, aquatic plant survey and management plan, and it says of the five invasive species observed at the res, three are very aggressive in their growth pattern. Just so you water made chestnut, them. curly leaf pond wheat, and Eurasian milfoil. Yeah. And then on page five on, on spy pond, um, the current situation, there's a sentence that says a new invasive variable milfoil was found in scary locations. That's right, that's what I just talked about. So I'm, I'm just, so, so we spend $26,000 a year on a harvester and we get rid of the, maybe we get rid of the water chestnuts, but then we hit, we're covered with milk oil and other invasives. So why are we spending that money if we're gonna have a problematic water body no matter what? Um, yeah, I just think this, the, 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 the two reports may have gotten confused. I didn't yeah. see. So the, the water chestnuts create a canopy a dense canopy and no other mill foil. The mill foil, these other things, they're just like secondary third on the list. But when we do get rid of the water chestnut, something else will probably take over, but it's, but it's not um, a major issue at this point. The, the water chestnut is the main thing we need to take care of. And when David talked about getting the uh, harvester, that's more or less so we can control our own destiny. I think that I've been here a few times on the water bodies uh, working group, but not, I'm not on that now, but we've promised that we're gonna deplete the seed bank. And that really hasn't happened. And there's been various reasons. And I think the primary reason is the fact that we haven't been able to get a machine out there in the optimal time. So each, um, each chestnut plant drops its seed, the seeds go in the, the seed bank or into the uh, substrate down the bottom and they can grow with any time within the next 10 years or 15 years. So that's the primary reason. The res also lowers its, um, lowers the level of the water. Anything on the edge is going to freeze and die. And so that doesn't come back. So that probably also takes a big uh, bite out of what's growing there outside of the chestnut plants. So those two reasons. And of course, if the sunlight's not getting in there, we're gonna, there's nothing growing beyond that point. So the canopy is the real reason, but we're helping it out by lowering the level. Um, no promises, but you will see those other invasives come in if the water chestnut was ever completely removed. And again, the, the problem with all the ponds in Arlington is it's managed landscape. We're, we're working with very deep sediment banks. It's filled with nutrients that all these plants love. 
and we just can't get in there and uh, and just dig it out because those permits aren't available. How many years have you been treating or uh, pulling water chestnuts? How many years have you been Oh, at least this? 10 or more. Oh, more, more, 20. 20. 20. Yeah. At some years we haven't. So Some years didn't happen. So it didn't happen during COVID. And when you lose a year, you, you actually lose more than a year because the seed, this, seed bank it goes grew up. Back, it grew goes back up. with such a vengeance. And then last year we got in really late. I think it was August. Got late, was yeah. August. July. Almost way July, too late yeah. to do it. And there were years we couldn't get the entire yeah. res. We had to leave, you know, the Pieces. Lexington side alone. Yeah. Um, and that was because of money, because of timing. It has not been um, successful, this management. We're hoping if we can get in earlier <laughs> that it will be successful and consistently. And that's another reason to put this bug in everybody's ear about owning a harvester, which is not, it's a, it's a small piece of equipment that can fit in a parking lot in you know, space. Um, and it could be be run by, you know, it's like like a boat on the water. Um, it's, it's not a very high tech solution, yeah. um, but if we owned one, we can, as Chuck said, uh, control when we use it. Yeah, we could be out there more than just the two weeks just we have now. Once. So it's facing the conveyor belt, and I'm not sure how it operates. I thought the one I saw that David looked like, um, it was pedal operated. So someone would just use the conveyor belt, bring up as much um, uh, invasives as they could possibly manage, and then bring it over to the shoreline and dump it off. We would still need the support of the DPW department to remove that from, uh, you know, and dump it. Do we know how the water chestnuts got to Slide Pond? No. So I, I'm, I, I've, I have seen all but one of those water chestnut plants. And um, so a water chestnut, unlike a lot of our other problems, are actually, if it's a small scale, they're very easy to deal with because oh, okay. they're, they're really, really visible. Often birds um, carry them. And um, uh, what, what happened, we had a, we had, Chances are they came from boats. And in fact, I think the, we had four sites of water chestnuts this year, this, this previous year, mm -hmm. almost surely it came from boaters. And because one was right by the boat ramp, another one was, uh, a, a, another one was further down the Spy Pond Park. Um, another one was found in front of those, uh, the condominiums. And, um, uh, uh, David and I found what we found three or four plants uh, near that gut between Elizabeth Island and and the shoreline, um, and and because they're so easily visible, you can we actually got all the seeds. I think I I think I let one seed loose. <laughs> um, um, so it's 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 the kind of thing where every couple of weeks you have to make a tour around the pond and look for them. So unless we ban boats, we're going to have that problem, or we educate and make people wash their That's boats. Right. It's very it's boats tough. We actually pond. looked into the, the spy pond committee looked into all that we could do about about doing it. Um, if you really want to do it, what you do is you hire somebody, you set up a hot water. Um, pressurized washing system that, uh, you know, and that's what they use on some of the lakes, like in the Berkshires, where they, they have a known problem and they really want to try to prevent it. Of course, we can't do that here. Um, we can improve our signage and we have, um, our signs are currently and we, 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 it's something we need to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Um, and the $5,000 expense of the CONCOM, what will that cover? Which one is that? Yeah, that's the miscellaneous. To, uh, oh, I the see. miscellaneous. Yeah, that's miscellaneous expenses. That's uh, things that come up set aside for incidentals. So, for example, if we get another um, harmful algal bloom, if we get it early enough, we would treat it with copper. Um, if you get it too late, you can't. So, um, it's kind of a, an incidental, you know, emergency fund. Other questions. Oh, and Annie. <clears throat> what do you do with the water chestnuts? I, I live in that area and I've seen just piles of them. Yeah. Who, who disposes of them and where do they go? DPW takes them, thankfully. They get 
trucked off as part of the trucking contract that the town holds and I dumped and they go into a landfill. Landfill. So first they're dried. <coughs> first they're dried, um, yes. We have a place we dry them near the reservoir and then they take them so that it's less bulk. But they can't be recycled or, or used in compost because it's an invasive plant. So they have to go to a landfill. So does the so DPW does that? Yes. 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 So the twenty six thousand you you spent basically is for the you know, harvester, the vendor, and the, hiring, uh, hiring the harvester, yes, transport and the person who runs it. Right. Yes. Okay. I want if we're going through that cost benefit analysis. Keep in mind, you need somebody who knows what they're doing to run it. You need to be able to clean the machine. You need to be able to maintain it, and you need to be able to store it over the winter. So there there are other costs besides just the capital. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we we have talked about that a little bit. We'd love to explore that with you. You know, it could fit under a tarp in the winter on a, in a parking space. So you know, there are. We'd love to have that conversation. We need a DPW. Involved, yeah. yeah, and with DPW. Yeah. yeah. Well, so first of all, if DPW is hauling it away, if they're having our regular trash contractor haul it away, it's being burned. Okay. So because all our trash is incinerated. Yeah. So. Just, that makes sense. Thank yeah, you. We do not mm -hmm. have access to the landfill. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I just want to second Al's thought about um, that particular purchase, but also that purchase doesn't go through us. It goes through the capital plan. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's their call whether or not it's yeah. an mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. We'll have to make that argument. Mm -hmm. But I do think you will still have operating costs. Yes. For it, and you'll have to figure out what those are because the wheels still will show up. Mm -hmm. Um, my second question is, why are we maintaining the fund balance? Why don't we just give you ten or fifteen thousand dollars this year and get that fund balance down to zero? Because mm -hmm. I personally would prefer that you not carry a fund balance, but you just ask us for what you need each year, mm -hmm. and that we always know what decision we're making about supporting this budget. So, yeah, comment. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the 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 the. Uh, the water bodies fund was set up. This five pond committee was actually yeah. involved in setting it up. Um, and uh, the reason that was that started was because uh, when we were trying to, the problems, the, the big problems, the, the big expenses for water bodies, are typically in the spring, because that's when plants are starting to grow and that collides with uh, the fiscal year. And so what happens is that you not have, you know, you don't have budget and so you can't, you can't treat. At least that was, that was the explanation that was given to me that, that, um, that, that, that because of the collision, that's why it was yeah, started. Balance, yeah, I have a feeling that Alan and Charlie okay. may have thoughts about that. Or maybe okay. simply, you know, as, as you said, we're budgeting now for something that happens a year from now or 14 months from now, which is sort of unpredictable based on climate, all sorts of other things, uh, whatever. So this acts as a reserve fund in case, no, in other words, we can either budget for the worst case every year or have a substantial reserve fund and budget more for the average. Except these are right. constant I mean, or costs. The alternative to come back to, re, to yeah, us I for mean, a reserve fund. But it's also, I could be wrong, and maybe Dean could, could correct me if I'm wrong, but you can encumber funds in June you're going to spend in July. Not the issue. Charlie, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, we, we went through this a number of times for a number of years. And, and basically, as I recall the discussion and think I understand it, sometimes the invasives come early in the spring. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they come late. Right. They and and that activity all happens before town meeting ends. And, and actually mm -hmm. the funds are not available until July 31st normally. You know, after the attorney general approves it, so oh, they need you're saying, Charlie. they need to have the money available when the ice melts, and and sometimes they don't spend it because there are no invasives, and sometimes there are invasives. So we went to this system of having a reserve fund or fund balance to take care of the stochastic nature of invasive plants. It's sort of like snow and ice, except you can't have a spend.
May I um, make one comment about that? Um, if you move this over a little bit and see what we're doing toward after FY we are taking it down. Um, so we are drawing it down. We realize it was too high and we are drawing it down, but we're doing it slowly kind of to be safe about it. Anything else, Annie? No, Charlie, I'm, not, I'm not sure the argument tracks, but I'll trust Charlie and Alan on it. It's great. Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Charlie. Actually, I, I was going to bring up exactly what they did is that, you know, 10 um, to eight years ago and maybe seven years ago, we had this conversation multiple times um, and came to this conclusion. And you're right, it is, I, that's what I was going to point out. It is. It, it has gotten really high, but you're dropping it down to 25. Is about 25 where you want it? I think it's a reasonable amount to have. Yeah. Okay. okay. About half a year. Yeah. Grant. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, it must be very frustrating. I'm just listening to this and, and hearing all the, <clears throat> the forecasting. It must be really frustrating to work at this. Um, I feel like throwing up my hands, but I don't feel like throwing extra money. Um, do you feel this is, uh, this isn't the part of the question, but it seems this has shifted from intractable to Sisyphean. I mean, for many years we're doing this. Same water chestnuts, same everything. So and I'm glad we're looking at some other alternatives, but we've been looking at all, We'd like to hear some alternatives, I think. So some alternatives I have a question about is, you mentioned this thing about the sediment. What, how are we addressing any of that? That's one question. Uh, let's start with that one. How are we okay. addressing any of that? That seems to be the root of the problem. So, so your, reaction, chemicals <laughs> yes, yes. your reaction is exactly mine. It's that Sisyphean. We're in a, yes, exactly. Yes. We're in a, this is an urban, watershed right here. Yeah. The problems were, were set up 100 years ago, right? Spy Pond, that where I'm living now, was all, all uh, garden uh, uh, market gardens. Mm -hmm. And the way they did it was they, they, put a, they put a wagon in downtown Boston at a stable. When they got the call saying the wagon is full, they brought it out to Arlington. They dumped manure on the beautiful um, glacial soil, glacial sand, and turned it into vegetables for, for that. Now that manure is high phosphorus. And, um, and I think that, and, and there have been complaints about Spy Pond for a hundred years now. Yeah. Now, there's, there's sort of the two easy things to do are to, well, no, the, the easy thing to do is to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And we've done nothing in the past and people who've been around in, 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 in the, 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 the worst was in the late fifties when, when Spy Pond was, was really, really bad. You think it's bad now, the water bodies are bad now. Back then, um, as, as someone quit, you could walk from Pleasant Street to Elizabeth Island without getting your feet wet. There was so much decaying. It was basically um, algae decaying and that kind of thing. So that's not an option. And then the question is, and the other option is you could solve the problem, drain Spy Pond, dig out all the muck. There's a lot of it. Find a place for it. Just to dig out, just to dig out you know, basically from here to there of sand. So not muck sand, just to dig that out and get it disposed, disposed it costs the mass DOT about a million and a half. And, and digging out all the spy pond, just, you can't do it. So if the goal is to try to figure out, the problem is not gonna go away. It's not gonna go away. It's, you're gonna hear, us, hear from us from now to eternity. Um, but the, the, the trick is to, try to minimize the growth of the problem. What that means is try to minimize how much stuff ends up on the sediment, because as the sediment grows closer to the surface, it's going to keep getting worse. Let's see. Yep. 
It keeps growing close. I mean, you, you that's right. That's right. But you, you minimize the rate. If okay. it was so, natural so, growth. So you're, so the, the way to address this, if I may paraphrase, yeah. the way yeah. to, to address the sediment problem yeah. is, well, just stop it from getting worse. No, no, not stop it. Slow it I mean, down. Oh, right. It, yeah. Again, not stop it. Yeah. Just keep it from getting, not keep it, but yeah. it, it's not getting better. It's not going to get better, okay. but I'm on the other hand, worse. and, and yeah. so instead of 35, uh, and I wasn't even asking about it, so, so there really is no cure. There is no cure, okay. but you can manage so it effectively. Can, but we've been, and also you say we've been doing nothing, but you know, it's not a lot of money and I'm a big, I live in this, I love, I love, I love yeah. the water and everything yeah. else. I'm a big yeah. advocate for this, but the concern is about how we're directing the money. And it's yeah. not a lot of money, but it is a lot of money. So no, we're not doing lot. anything. We've done nothing, but we've spent a lot of money for the last Yes, and we've kept saying Spy Pond. If you were on Spy Pond this summer, there was a, a period of two weeks when it was not usable or, or more difficult. The northern basin was okay, but the like, the rowers couldn't go. But other than that, it was an absolutely fabulous summer. You could I go appreciate swimming, that. You could that, sail, that, you could do all that, kinds of things. Very good. So thank you for the first question. There yes. is no, the answer is there isn't a cure. There isn't, there isn't a, cure. a cure, but you can manage it. Okay. So the I second question. Mitigation. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's like, it's like mowing your lawn. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 it's not. It's not. We, we don't get more snow. Snow is getting worse. It's like a pond in the middle of nowhere. It's going to burn into a swamp. Well, that's the second part of this is the drain is the, um, is the red. So I, I appreciate that. You know, the problem is the sentiment, and we're not really addressing the sentiment, we're addressing everything around the se sentiment, and, and okay, but enough of sentiments about sediment. <laughs> um, when the may, I, may I offer one thing about going back to Spy Pond? Well, I, actually, I, the sentiment applies to all the water. True. Yes, yes, true. Right. Spy Pond more than that. True. Right. Not just Spy Pond. Yeah, yeah. True. Um, and, and there is a solution to sediment in McLennan. I think you could dredge McLennan. So there is yeah. a solution in that set of basins that you can dredge and it's supposed to be dredged that's in the permit that we permitted years ago but it was never done that's an you know another we can have that discussion um however in spy pond what we're looking at i feel your pain i felt the same way i said this is not working we're throwing money at it every year we at, that's, that's why we change vendors that. we change vendors because they weren't doing it Okay, they weren't doing it. We changed vendors last year. We got a, a new plan. We have a new vendor. We're going to, to treat it earlier, but we're also going to be proactive. We're going to try to do a pilot study of introducing native vegetation. We have no native aquatic vegetation growing in Spy Pond. I think that's horrific. It's horrific. So we're going to introduce a pilot project to try to do that. That will control sedimentation too. When you get the native population growing, and if we can replicate that, we're going to reduce how we need to treat it. Hopefully they'll, they'll proliferate and we can start on doing a positive improvement rather than just always chasing the invasive. So I just wanted to point that out. That's one initiative. We're going Appreciate to do. one, one option is do a pilot yeah. study to find a, bring, try and bring back native plants yeah. that have been eradicated yeah. by invasive plants. Yeah. Um, so the, the second question I had, um, thank you for the answer for the first mm -hmm. elaboration. Sure. The second question I had was, um, speaking about the 100 years ago, you know, and that sort of stuff when they used to carve ice out of Spy Pond, but there was no Arlington Reservoir. There was no Arlington Reservoir. They kind of dammed it up and they tried to make it a drinking reservoir is what it was, and that failed. Mill owners brought suit and won. Uh, that was 100 years or 150 years ago. What would happen? So we occasionally drain the res, and I'm torn. I, can't, I hear like in some ways it's effective, in some ways it's not. It seems to me it would be very effective. What if we drained the res entirely? Because the swimming swimming section is totally different. Has there been any consideration about draining the res entirely for a certain period of time, and then do some manual community service? school project type of stuff, scour the sediment, whatever, because it is possible in the res to drain it. It's not spy pond or something. So has that ever been considered? Yes. 
We just had a proposal this past winter. So every winter, the water level gets brought down. The lowest it really ever gets is, you know, the lowest that the topography slopes from the spillway down to sort of the basin. So if the water has to go up, it can't get out, right? So it's in that area between the spillway and the lowest water level that we could make a difference with volunteers. And folks did ask about doing that. We didn't have capacity to pull it off as a volunteer event this year, but I think that that's a viable strategy. It's essentially manual removal, um, similar to when folks go out in canoes and pull the full grown plants. In this case, you're just taking up the seeds off the, off the bed of the reservoir. So I fully support that approach. I think that's a great idea. Uh, so what is the plan about that? Do it next year. Do what? Oh, get volunteers together and have them go out on the flats of the reservoir and pick up the seeds. And, and I'm sorry for multiple questions. Why didn't it work last year? There wasn't enough time. Between coordinating the drawdown of the res and mobilizing volunteers, there was, there was not a window so of opportunity. This year? Yeah, we could do that this, this year. Well, I mean, with advanced planning, we're March now. We, we can get it done for the So I guess what I'm trying to nicely say is, are you advanced planning? Yes. No. Yeah, so just to be clear, we're not talking about draining the entire res. This is just the annual drawdown that we're talking about, and we're just doing a select portion of the. It's a partial drain down, yeah. 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 And when are we talking? I mean, so I'm trying to get more detail about you saying, oh, we're going to, we're thinking about writing a board. Well, well when is it going to happen? What's the plan? It was. Or mailing, when did they or, you know, lower the, the. Well, it was suggested that the people collect this seeds from the bottom, but. I'm not sure. There's other issues as well, too, I think, in terms of dredging and distributing the water. Also, and it's not dredging. dredging. Wait, it's when do they lower the water levels in the rest? Oh, after the beach closes. Yeah. You've got at least one volunteer to help. Yeah. 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 yeah, just send me a mailer or, <laughs> and you know, arrange it because it doesn't sound like it's being being planned. And I hope that we get it planned before next year and you come back and ask because you won't go away. I won't go away on that either. So, following, all right, thank you. Following up on, on Grant, you just said that McLennan is supposed to be dredged, but it hasn't. Right. Well, why are, we, why are we spending any money anywhere else if we can, if there's a solution, we can, we can stop what, what has been happening in all these other water bodies sounds to me if because it's, it's a small pond why aren't we why aren't we dumping the month fifty thousand dollars on something like that so we can start so the start reason well. why uh reedsbrook can get dredge is because it's actually a stormwater detention basin and so it can be managed uh, it's by pond and the res they can't be it's, you wouldn't get a permit to do the dredging or it would be 10 years before you got a permit so it's been discussed with the DPW. I don't know where they are with this dredging, but um, it's, uh, you know, I think David, you, you've been looking into this, but that is something where you could get a permit from the Conservation Commission and with enough money, you could dredge Reach Brook. I will say that the amount in our coffers, even last year's amount, highest it's been, that project way outstrips the amount of funding available. We need to first evaluate the pond, establish what the conditions were at the outset. So essentially get an as-built plan for the detention ponds, which requires a survey. We then need to establish a monitoring protocol in order to determine how sediment flows into the and how much it builds up over time. So we're looking at like a five-year monitoring period. Already we're way past the funding available. And then on top of that, we need to dredge. And you heard Brad's estimate for how much dredging would cost in the spy pond. So- No, no, that was, that was how yeah. much it actually costs just to do for a small portion. Small, small, small just portion. to do the sand hook. Right, to do just, to do, just to the portion. So, there, there is much larger outside funding that's needed, and I'm pursuing that. So, 
for the testing to make sure that it's not contaminated. So my bond was contaminated. That just can't be spread out somewhere. Special trucks, uh, custody for all the material. So that's my bond's problem. We don't know what's at Reedsbrook. It, I mean, if you're thinking, hey, let's just take it out and spread it out on someone's mm. yard or in a, in a field, mm. that's probably not what's going to happen with that mm. stuff. So it's expensive. It's a different kind of problem. So yeah, you could we could we could get that approved. We just need a lot of money it's and more time. Very expensive. The big solutions are very expensive. But we're behind the eight ball for twenty years at the rest, throwing money at it, and we're not getting any any progress. Here's an opportunity to maybe get ahead of something and at least one water body. I'm just putting that out there. All right, more questions. We keep the reservoir useful during the yeah. summer. So people use it during I, the I summer. I don't think we're getting behind the eight ball with the spy pond. I think you would have to have never touched it to find out where exactly you would be right now. We might have some developers proposing homes and lots on, on spy pond right now if no one ever did anything over there. It, it would grow in almost, if we stopped all this, it would just grow in. I mean, you have, it's just like a park. It's, a, it's, a, it's an aquatic park. It's an expensive aquatic park for the maintenance. But every year you have to do maintenance. If you want your yard to look good, you have to get rid of the crabgrass. If you want people to use the crew teams to be out there, there can't be weeds. Someone can't fall in the water and get tangled up in the weeds and have a problem. We have to, if we're going to use it, it has to be in a usable condition and we have to be able to understand what we're putting out there when we ask people to come and enjoy Spy Pond. So I, I don't, I think that we've kept it open. Um, it's, it's had some years where there's been a lot of uh, algae blooms and, and cover on top of the pond and people have commented on it, but for the most part, it's, it's open and it's usable. And that might be what is the best we can offer and the best we can hope for unless some other, uh, some big money comes in and we can start dredging some areas. But, you know, there's also a lot of outfalls. So not only do we have to maintain Spy Pond, we have to maintain everyone's yard and that watershed and everything that goes into Spy Pond. So it's all connected. It's, like I said, it's a managed landscape. It's not just about cleaning one area. You pick up the, you pick up the chestnuts on that shelf over the winter, are you digging for the rest of them? Are you gonna sift through the dirt? Now those are growing next year too. You're gonna to get really frustrated doing it that way. You have to wait until they deplete themselves. And we've been waiting a long time for that. And, and that's what's been frustrating. Always asking what's, you know, what are we taking out in weight? And is there less weight the following year? And it really hasn't been. We've been taking out exactly the same amount and we've never caught up with it. So we were hoping with our water chestnut harvester, we could, instead of having a two week process or a month process, we could have someone out there most of the summer, just picking up and then hopefully even using that machine in other lakes um, in Arlington and see if we could really help out in that area too. So that, that was the plan on buying our own. I guess it was a plan of frustration. Charlie and then Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I have several questions. Um, questions, comments. Um, first of all, um, I wanted to thank the uh, Water Bodies Committee for a very comprehensive and readable report that was circulated uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, my, my first question is about Hills Pond. Uh, in the report, it mentions that um, there was an algae bloom developed in the early fall. Um, and treatment had to be curtailed. I also read the report of water and what's it called? Water and uh, water, 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 water. And um, they sort of indicated that the uh, declaration that the that Hills Pond was uh, algae infested with cyan, cyanobacteria was premature, if, if not wrong. Can, can you clarify that? Because once that declaration was made, there was no more possibility of treating the pond. And I understand from the water, uh, from the uh, water and wetlands report that it was not cyanobacteria, but duckweed or something like that. That was water and wetlands initial opinion. They tested it later, it turned out it was in fact cyanobacteria. Florida Health evaluates the 
uh, presence of cyanobacteria and the first indication of it by sight is the first first action they take is to shut it down out of an abundance of caution. So that was the course of action this past summer and presumably will be in the future. However, we're starting to test regularly for the presence of cyanobacteria. So if we get a report from the Board of Health, we can say, well, what was the last observation? Does it contain cyanobacteria or is it maybe mistakenly done? We can have a conversation about that. We can additionally do testing that day. I mean, it's a 10 minute walk from my office. I can skip up there and skim a little water overnight it to the labs as part of our contract with water and wetlands and then test it. So if the uh, ruling comes down from Board of Health, we can either get it lifted as soon as possible or just delay it such that we don't actually you know, make that proclamation. Can we do treatments that prevent the cyanobacteria from uh, uh, cyanobacteria or algae? From we could treat it early. Yeah. Okay, so there, uh, this is a point that I wanted to make about spy pond as well. So there are methods for preventing the growth of algae that are just mitigating the amount of contamination that a water body receives. Some of those techniques involve treatment of stormwater outfalls. So you can use, for example, um, bioremediation. There are inserts that you can get to put around a stormwater outfall that catch an amount of the contamination so that when we're not when we're feeding more stormwater into these water bodies we're capturing the sediments and the contaminants that cause the growth of algae in the other places so that's one option that we can consider those are costly options there are highly engineered options, so we need to work with engineering on the implementation of that, make sure we're not screwing up stormwater flows, et cetera, but it's an option. The other thing to address is we're working on algae in the ponds regularly. That's what Water and Wetland was there doing for most of their visits. They were applying algaecides to keep those levels down. So in the regular course of events, I say that and then admit readily that we're about to experience far more heat waves, far more droughts, far more excessive rainstorms in light of climate change. And so there is no regular course of events. This is going to be iterative and responsive. And the more attention that we can pay to it, the safer Arlington residents are going to be from things like harmful outcomes. And may I just add that um, in terms of process, we're trying to coordinate a lot better with the Department of Health. Once the Department of Health goes out to a water body and makes a statement that it's potentially harmful algae and sends that to the state, there's nothing we can do in water bodies or conservation. We can't touch it. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to coordinate better. David has reached out and we have an agreement where if there is an investigation, we do it together. So we can do this testing and we can make sure that if it's harmful, yes, it goes to the state as a report, but if it's not, if it's something else or duckweed, we don't report it. So that's one one way we're trying to. But we will be treating. But we will, if early. it is, if we catch it early, we can treat it. And, and we do have that in our permit. We treat it with a copper algicide. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so um, I just want to make one comment about the, we had this big discussion about dredging. We did dredge Hills Pond about 25 years ago completely dug it out and, and, and then we maybe it was 30 years ago I'm not sure but it was a, it was a massive project and the town uh, I believe the town funded it uh, through the capital budget I'm not 100 percent positive I have to go back and look and, and the whole project was was very successful in improving the water quality as some people have, have asked here um, the one major problem that we had, was disposal of the material. We found out that um, it's not so easy to just take this stuff out and send it somewhere. And so it wound up going into the backfield at, at uh, Menominee Arts Park, which was a disaster because it was made the field five feet higher than the surrounding areas and was threatening trees and so forth. Eventually, they, the town found a place where they could bring the material, they took it all out and you know, life went on. But 
Um, it is, I mean, I don't know if it's permitted to dredge. It must be because the town did it. Mm -hmm. And, and it, so dredging is definitely a solution that can work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just big pictures or questions, comments. One is that I hear a lot of frustration on all sides. I also hear some cautious optimism about some of the plans for the future. Yeah. That, that you think that you know we've been sort of battling this in a system way, but there's some possibility of inching ahead of it to some extent. Um, also, David, you're new, fairly new, right? Um, when did you first start? It was a year and a half ago. Year and a half. And I've heard great things about you. Um, so, so I suspect that lots of energy is coming that way. Um, then other big picture sort of questions, it sounds like now that we've, um, we will have um, pulled down the reserve, we're looking at asks of more line of 80,000 in, in the coming years. Does that feel about the right numbers? Just looking at it's 76. No, we're spending about 50 a year. But when we get down the reserves, yeah, then the total spending. Look at the bottom line. The bottom line, the, line, the actual the annual line. expenditures. Oh, are annual expenditures. expenditures. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. We we had yeah. talked yeah. internally. Right. I mean, there there is the ten thousand dollar increase. In <laughs> but it's going to get even higher. Right. It's just a, like just a yeah. um, Then I I have a question. Have you, have you approached capital yet about some of these capital ideas? We started those discussions, or is this not happened? Not not started yet. Yes, I did put in for capital funding for uh, the harvester this yep. year as well. Okay. Um, I'm just in tandem with CPA just to see what happened. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I have a one very tiny question. Um, the outfalls, you've mentioned that several were broken, and I was wondering what does it mean for an outfall to be broken? Okay. And how do you fix it? Okay. <laughs> sure. So I don't know if you've ever walked along the Mystic River. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's so if you walk along that path there, if, if next time you do it, if you look down to the river every once in a while where you can see an opening, you'll see a concrete, yep. some concrete blocks. When the concrete blocks separate, they're kind of partially in the water mm -hmm. and they're like not attached to anything. Okay. That's a head wall that's broken. Mm -hmm. So it should have been, there should have been a, a pipe and a flange and a little concrete thing and it should have been all connected and it's not. Okay. So first of all, it's broken. Second of all, we haven't done any of the stormwater improvements upstream of that. You know, so what's happening with the stormwater at that point? Is it? It's just. It's just going, going every, straight yeah. into Mystic River. So it, an outflow. I mean, I mean, you mentioned these sort of fancy things you can put on it, but a regular outfall would it protect the water bodies a little bit more without these fancy extra things? Or no, um, just get no there you anyway. need to do something. Okay. So either, um, if you looked at the pretty picture on the front here, <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but on the side, this is this is just, I mean, an easy thing to do at the edge. This is the edge of the outfall and it's rock mm -hmm. and it's a swale. So actually, mm -hmm. instead of the water going directly in here with a oh, pipe, <clears throat> the pipe's back here and it filters it down into uh -huh. these rocks and then it goes in. And so you can see the water here is really clear. Right. And if you look at the water on those broken outfalls, it's cloudy. It's got all these particles in okay, it. Okay, so just so even a minimal water improvement water. Okay. there. Would, but there's lots but of other things so we can do. do. Absolutely. Also, I'm an avid kayaker, so I love water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, you, you can see it better from the river. So yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. you kayak, yeah. yeah. Questions over here. Peggy, do you have a hand up? Go ahead. Do we have public access to the entire shoreline? It's five point. No. no. That's unfortunate. Thank it's you. just the way it is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Have you thought how you might see managing these open water bodies for larger chunks of time than two years? Like <laughs> what it might be like in five years, that type of Thinking is that is there long range planning around this type of stuff? Did you want to take that? I'll take that. Okay. Quick okay. Okay. Um, so we are uh, something that we started. We're about a little over halfway through. Um, uh, Tufts Tufts is on. Actually, they use Spy Pond as a as a a, a classroom um, for water for water products for water quality and uh, one of, of 
or John Durant. Durant. Durant yes, He's John Durant's professor. students. Mm -hmm. um, Gabby Ackerman Logan has, volunteer, has, has decided to take on Spy Bond as a project. She's a little over half. She's completed half of it last year, and she's got another half. They've got. She's collecting all the material that that Tufts has gathered over the last 13 years on water quality and any other material that she can find. I, I sent her a whole bunch of stuff from uh, that uh, previous studies, and she's going to combine that all up, show show the historical trends, and and produce a. a of, of suggestions on how to how to improve the situation. Um, so that's one one area. Um, I'm looking myself in doing this map of, of sediment of, of for spy pond, and I presented the initial results at the New England Botanical uh, Society um, uh, last month. Um, and also, if I could interject. Yeah, sure. um, all of our permits for these water bodies are three years. So whenever we come around and permit them again, we do an evaluation and like a three-year planning. What, what is going to be entailed in, in this? What do we need for this water body? And um, our new vendor um, that you heard, SWCA, is helping us with that. They did a, some new surveys last year for us so we could start on that plan again. Yeah. But it has to be an, a plan that's adaptive. It's right. got to be exactly. adaptive management, okay. as David said. Yeah. We, we are getting, with climate change, we are getting more mm -hmm. algal blooms, yeah. more yeah. droughts. Um, these are stressors on our water bodies. Yeah. But it might help that feeling of just throwing money and not seeing an improvement by having some clear objectives, mm -hmm. some, some, oh, hey, we're going to make this a rather a deep going to go to a C minus mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. you know, some concrete measurement mm -hmm. that we could point to to the town to 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 avoid this feeling of throwing money at it. Mm -hmm. Throwing money mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. This is exactly what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 a multi body problem. Mm -hmm. it's just just it's it's tough. It's tough. And and as you notice we 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 gave up the old way, started a new a new group. And crossing our fingers. And if they don't work out, there's other people. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out eventually. Great. But it takes a lot of time. It takes people in time. But also yeah. communicating our like three year plans. Yeah. Maybe we're yeah. not communicating that well either, yeah. which yeah. is, yeah. I hear your, what you're saying. Yeah, you got a good idea. The surveys and plans don't help if we don't consult them with the plan. <laughs> So we can spend a lot of money for plans, but yeah, you know, follow them. You got to, you got to, got to make things yeah. happen. Yeah, question, Carolyn. I've sort of lost where we were with the dredging at McClellan. If we'd already paid for dredging to have happened, no, we didn't. No, well, okay, but it was part of a contract. Part of a permit. Oh, okay. And that was like part how many years ago? Twenty years ago? When yeah. did we do McClellan? Oh, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, it was yeah. part of the operations and maintenance, and maintenance manual mm -hmm. that was meant to follow the construction. And as far as I can tell, I've spent tens of hours researching this in the archives. That was never conducted. So we are so we are unfortunately as a town not real good at follow up maintenance for some of our projects. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a cost. So, so that's yeah. another capital potential to present. It may be we've considered a lot of different avenues for it. We thought about getting an earmark. We've thought about getting state funding for it. Um, there, there are many opportunities to pay for that work at that scale. I mean, we may have to look to federal funding from FEMA or something of the likes and do our homework in order to get that level of money. But um, those are the considerations that we have for the future. Any more questions, Sophie? Just a quick one that we haven't brought up, and this is just maybe peanuts and not too helpful, but there was mention of a contractor mowing down sort of buffer zones. Are there consequences and any revenue from fees assessed for actions like that? It's DPW, so. Yeah, it's, no. there could, I will say that, there could. <laughs> if it's, 
<laughs> sort of hard to shoot yourself I, I, in your yeah, foot. <laughs> it, it would either be levying fines against DPW or the <laughs> recreation department. And so yeah. so we tend not to want to do that. Internal, internal, always, internal. Okay. So, so yeah. we're trying education. But. And around Spike Pod, where it's private properties, I guess, all around, is there ever, do they ever contribute to the upkeep of Spike Ponds? Very much so. The yeah. fertilizer flyer I had, <clears throat> it was so nice. I sent a note out, especially the Cowan Manor Association, and I got back, oh, I got, I guess about 12, 12 just residents just spending an afternoon doing, doing the fertilizer flyer. That was part of it. Um, the, uh, the, 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 it's a, it's a great resource. And it just needs to be taken care of. So, uh, Topher, did you have questions? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, well, first, you mentioned I believe that you had gone to the CPA for certain things. So I would say that's another potential source of funding for some of the things you're looking at. The comment. The other was um, I saw you talking about Mill Brook and how it's mostly stormwater runoff. And that in other places you've got infiltration trenches. Is that something you? I know you're not asking for money for that now, but is that something that you could potentially do? Absolutely. So uh, have done, continue to do. Just this week, I actually was it yesterday. No, what's today? Say Monday. <laughs> Where are we? Last week, Friday. Monday. <laughs> Weekend was a blur. I, Friday, I filed a four million dollar year mark. For uh, in partnership with the Mystic River Watershed Association for infiltration trenches that our engineering department division pioneered, and we're going to try and get them funded throughout the watershed. And Arlington would see a sizable piece of that. Actual practice. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Anything else? Good. Dean. Yeah, so I'm going to I do want to thank you for coming in. Um, I I know you had a like there were a lot of questions and. In comments tonight. Oh, I don't have any questions, by the way. This is all I'm giving you. Um, <laughs> no, I know you have a lot of questions and comments, but in you know, when I when I look at this budget, it's like one of the rare budgets that's the dollars are disproportional to the impact. Usually small budgets, and this is small budgets have small impact, big budgets, police fire schools, big impact, right? But this has this, it's like a mismatch, right? It's small money, but it's big impact because if the water bodies turn into swamps, then it's gonna be awful, right? Um, and I do want to say before you go that. I, I hope you appreciate that. I think the questions um, reflect people's passion for the subject and our desire to have great water, like clean water bodies or whatever the proper term is, not have these like things growing, right? Um, and that we are like really appreciative for the work um, everyone does on this because, um, you know, the alternative would be terrible, right? And so I just wanted to, like, because I think sometimes when you're sitting here, you get like all these questions. Wow, did they not like what we did? Or they're not happy with what we did? I don't think anyone's saying that. No one's like, I think it's just, you're, you're just hearing people's passions towards the subject that has um, a lot of interest. And I think it, it doesn't negate the fact that you guys all do excellent slash great work. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I want to wrap this up because David is willing to talk to us about gas leaks and open space. So I want to be able to spend some time on that. So many questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the Mystic River is getting a lot better. I can tell you, the last 10 years, the wildlife is just increasing and increasing. There's multiple heron, there's multiple swan, all sorts of stuff. So the Mystic River is getting better. Um, and I have noticed there's a proliferation of swan and reds as well, which is great because swan are beautiful. But do swan eat water chestnuts? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, the answer, the answer, no. Is, the answer is no. Can we answer chestnuts? No. The, the water no. chestnut is a hard shell with spikes on it. And well, that's the sea. Definitely <laughs> remember it. So, so that's what your little you kids eat? step on it in the, in right. the rest sometimes. The they go, what is this? It's a dinosaur egg. Yeah. And they stick to the birds sometimes. Mm -hmm. This is low way rats eating. Oh, great. Well, that would be explained. Put them in the electronic traps. Right. All right. So.
Just a real quick thank you. This is my first in-person committee meeting. This has been fabulous. <laughs> Giving us an hour and a half is just such a treat with real people and, <laughs> and real discussion. I think we learned a, a little bit about each other. I could recommend a few other things. <laughs> 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 I, I do want to thank you for your report. I, I was impressed that you were like honest. Here, here are the problems. Here are the things that we not we mm -hmm. the town has screwed yeah. up over the years, and we need to do better. And I yeah. I, I do appreciate that yeah. a lot. I, I think that that, that that is a lot. And you've fun. given us some good food for thought. Yeah, too. very good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Thank you. All right. Well, okay. what are the parties is done, but David, if you can answer some questions. We're going to start Okay, so we have two requests, budget requests. One for uh, the gas leak task force budget and the other for the um, open space committee. Um, David, do you want to, which one would you want to start with? Let's do open space committee first. Okay. Um, let me just the, the memo we have the memo says there's an, a request for two thousand dollars but the backup indicates four thousand so mm -hmm. okay so you're trying to do too many things at one time. <laughs> so you, it's two thousand. It's, it's a two thousand dollar request. All right. So tell us why you need that money and why the open space. Sure. Well, I'm going to just. I'm. My name is Wendy Richter, and I'm um, one of the newly um, new volunteer to do the um, co co chair of the open space committee. Welcome. So our open space committee is responsible for preparing and implementing our open space and recreation plan. And the 2022 plan, of course, was just recently released. This is a policy document that the town will rely on um, in the coming years. These are seven year plans. So every, uh, every decade-ish, we revisit it. And this is a document that I use as uh, environmental planner. I treat this essentially as my to-do list. And um, I want to underscore, underscore just how significant this plan is to me and also how much work had been done on the plan by this committee of late. Um, open space and recreation plans are state requirements to maintain fund funding and eligibility for uh, state funding programs. <clears throat> Other municipalities, write a, a page and a half, they copy and paste their justifications for doing their work and they simply move on. The Open Space uh, Committee has put in hundreds, maybe thousands of volunteer hours into a, a formal plan that the planning department can then take and use in tandem with the committee as an environmental planning document. So, it's one of those things that if it didn't exist, it would need to be created. The Open Space Committee had the initiative to go and create a very robust plan of their own volition and have done for many years. Uh, the plan details 53 town-owned parcels and 14 privately owned parcels, considers all of the needs and concerns on those locations, talks about the community's vision for those locations, how they want to see them used, how they benefit from them and so forth. The total report clocks in at 827 pages. This is no light lift. It took years to put together. This is a very robust document, as I say. So now uh, Wendy and the committee and I are tasked with implementing that plan. So the 
plan was last it updated, of course, in 2015. The last one sort of ran its course. We implemented a number of the goals and actions in that plan. Um, this new one is an opportunity to bring new focus to open space and recreation planning, uh, combining environmental stewardship, natural hazard, and climate adaptation planning, uh, complete streets, and doing this all under the umbrella of open space and recreation priorities. So to that end, we laid out four goals. These are important to read off, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them to you verbatim. First one is to protect the natural environment, to retain its important functions and values and help Arlington adapt to and mitigate the impacts of climate change. Second one is to ensure the town's recreational facilities, conservation areas, and other public spaces meet local needs and are accessible, safe, and welcoming to all Arlington residents. Third one is to support local and regional capacity to meet the needs for recreational opportunities natural resource protection and overall resource management to be resilient to climate change. And the fourth one, which is the crux of this funding, built environmental stewardship and public awareness to support the town's recreational facilities, conservation areas, and other public spaces. So as I mentioned, the, there was a very impressive public planning effort that went into this. They took this up during the pandemic, no less, and still managed to accomplish it and relatively close to the time frame that we wanted to do it. Um, you know, so all this to say, establishing sustainable funding mechanisms for the Open Space Committee and the actions in the plan, it, it's vital. It's similar to how we were talking about maintaining our water bodies as essentially parks. These are the parks that we're referring to. Um, so before income, we've got a $2,000 request. We'll divide that in half. The first half will be allocated to printing costs for the open space and recreation plan. The committee plans to host a release party for the open space and recreation plan, sort of a kickoff. We'll do that as a celebration of the committee's accomplishments and to bring folks in on the ground floor, so to speak, to get the other towns, uh, rather the towns, other departments, committees, uh, boards, et cetera, involved in the planning for the next seven years, in the implementation, I should say, for the next seven years. We'll also involve the volunteers and the organizations who are named in the plan. Many, many uh, private organizations, I think, probably five have active roles to play in the open space and recreation plan. And so we plan on printing just the first 200 pages of the plan, trying to save costs here, not going for the full uh, 827. The essential portions to distribute at this event would be 25 copies of the plan for the folks who will eventually be tasked with implementing it alongside myself in the committee. And that during uh, EcoFest, I believe I said, and happy to send you an invitation. We'd love to see you there. The second half of the funding is likewise for public education and outreach. So the committee's received funding since 2020, I believe. It's been a $300 award annually. Uh, only a portion of these funds were spent in Think back to 2020, we had like a year maybe before we went into lockdown and then we were not spending much money in the interim. So sort of a, a sensible explanation there, but we are, we were winding down the old plan as well. So now that this new plan has uh, the goal to build some uh, publicity and uh, visibility into uh, the role that the Open Space Committee plays, we're looking to increase that funding uh, to $1,000. There are a number of uh, objectives and actions named within the plan that, again, I'll read to you that these uh, funds can and will be put towards. One is to expand and enhance opportunities to utilize non-traditional open spaces. So those would be things like pocket parks or you know the sort of pop-up dining spaces that we see. If we're using things um, 
using creative means to make more open space. We want to direct more people to those. We want to increase attention paid to those kinds of spaces. We also want to focus on adding wayfinding and interpretive signage, other materials that get uh, incorporated into historic sites, conservation areas, and so forth. Uh, one example of this right now that we've been working on is called Picture Post. It's a service where you can position your smartphone on top of a, a podium and take the same, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Same vantage. Mm -hmm. Time over time. So you can see the way that the landscape changes seasonally over a period of years, et cetera. It's one of those public engagement types of activities that you can find in our open spaces around town. We also spend additional funds on uh, events like town day, for example. We need to reserve our booth. We need to print materials and things of the like. And now that all these things are happening in person again, thankfully, those will be enhanced uh, in terms of their ambition and their cost. Um, so in addition to what I've summarized, Open Space Committee is set to embark on two CPA projects this year. And I think with that, we'll be looking at increased visibility. And so our ability to explain what the Open Space Committee is to the public, it will entail more needs in terms of printing and um, publicity. So the committee is energized. We're ready to implement this plan, take a more active role in the community. And I think their hard work is evidenced by the quality of the plan that they drafted. And I think we'll see benefits back from uh, or paid to Arlington residents from this modest investment. So Wendy, you want to add something? Well, I just want to say that um, having participated on the master plan process and the implementation of the master plan, I feel like this is kind of another plan and implementation, but we are a volunteer committee and um, we don't have a department that's working to implement this. So this is a, not a very large uh, amount that we're looking for to help us do that implementation of this, this new plan. It's an important point. You go into anybody's office in town hall, you'll see a copy of the master plan. I think it's important for all of our plans to be held in that esteem. And the open space and recreation plan is not on anybody's desk currently. The old one expired. So we need to we need to get these out to town department heads and the likes. Okay, questions. Annie. Is two thousand dollars enough? That was a long list. We have $1,000 just for the printing of the 25 copies of the plan. Mm -hmm. That will be sufficient for distribution. $1,000 is likely enough for the coming year. I think when we crunch the numbers on what our regular commitments are, mm -hmm. we, we really only get up to the $300 level, adding these other projects and uh, increase visibility and so forth. I think we'll do that in a measured way. So we're not gonna be you know, overspending by any stretch. I think we're, we're scaling up. So like I said, we'll do it measuredly. So um, given that this is the first year you're looking at a large, you know, large number, it's still a small number, but that you're looking at a larger number, when you come back next year, which I suspect we'll ask you to, can you have a more detailed analysis of the actuals of where things were spent, which will make it easier? Because one of the things you're talking about is the printing $1,000 to print X. More often than not, groups come back and ask for the same amount. It's like, wait, but you already spent $1,000 on X, and X is done. Um, and so we'll want to see very specifically, because um, this is pretty basic for this year, which makes sense, but in the future, just keep that in mind. And thanks. Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, first of all, congratulations on that uh, open space report. Um, strangely, I, I read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it's, and the first part is 188 pages, not 200. Yeah. 
<laughs> and and the uh, one of the appendices I think is 495 pages. I don't know. I can't remember the other one. But a question I have is uh, why do you have to print it? I mean, uh, who's going to carry around and use a 180 page report when it can be on a PDF in, in your computer or your iPhone? And um, I did a quick check at Staples, and printing that report quantity one was going to be something like thirty-five or forty dollars, and quantity one hundred was going to be four thousand dollars. I don't know what the number is, you know, for twenty-five. I actually didn't pick that number because there wasn't enough information in the request that we got from the town manager. So that's that's the first thing I, you know, is this the right thing to do to print this report? Uh, I would recommend on the, on the town website that you, you've got 13 sections here. Um, but never mind, I think. Scratch that comment. Um, you've got 13 sections. Oh, you, and you also have the entire report that can be downloaded at the bottom, which is, I think, important. Yep. So um, I also think it would have been helpful with that request from the town manager that some of these items that you just described had been just you just enumerated had been described. I mean, it was just one request for printing, you know, sort of vague, especially considering the quite a momentous work. So, so do, you, um, do you have a response to why do you need to print? Yes. I think it's important that so we're representing physical spaces. We're talking about access to and use of actual locations. As I say, we need the specificity and I think the <coughs> gravitas that comes with a printed report to be on every department desk in town hall. It also matters that we're working with a number of volunteers and uh, partner organizations and so forth who won't as readily you know, have access to digital versions of the point. Granted, it's, it's on the website, but the folks who are not thinking about Arlington's open space and recreation plan will not know to go look for that. So having that on a shelf in the Mystic River Watershed Association office, I think does a lot to get us out into the community in, in, a, in a literally solid, sort of way so that people have something tangible to, to look at, flip through, understand what we're representing in terms of Arlington's open spaces and you know point to those things. Call me up and say, all right, I see objective AC, you want to do X, Y, and Z, so we're thinking about that too. How do we make that happen together? What's the actual total amount that you're asking? Total amount is 2,000 for uh, one half for the project related costs, printing, et cetera, publicity. The first half is 25 copies of the plan. That's what runs the thousand dollars. And I got that from Swifty and I can provide a no, actual estimate. That's what it was. Any more questions? Sophie? I'm probably mistaken. I was under the impression that this kind of committee was uh, more advisory and preparing a report, and then once the report is done, sort of giving it to the town. Is there really a continued, um, I don't know, when it was established, does it continue on for infinity, or does the committee intended to end at some point once the report is final until the next one is needed? Well, there are ongoing actions in the plan, so they'll be involved with the implementation of those from now to the publication of the next plan. So committee doesn't get dissolved in between creation of the plan. Additionally, the uh, statutory sort of um, mandate from, I believe it was select board to form this committee includes the implementation of the plan. So we, we have both the creation and implementation side of things delegated to us. And the, and the committee also does a fair amount of just tracking you know, monthly meetings where we go over where we are with different goals. And we, it's not like the old plan stopped. It's like we were running, it was like a, a relay race where you pass off with the time we're running with the old one while we were putting together the new one. All right, if there aren't any other 
Charlie, have one more question? Yes, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, have you given any thought to in all of the very um, well considered aspects of the plan, have you given any thought to the cost of the implementation? Not your cost, but the town's cost. In other words, what is the impact, the, the financial impact of all these things? A lot of them are course of business type of activities. So, you know, me as environmental planner, my, my role is a half-time position on the other half on conservation agent, right? So as I say, this plan is essentially my checklist for my, my aims of environmental planning. It, it informs the town's prerogatives in those terms. So um, in that way, it is, as I said earlier, you know, if it didn't already exist, it would need to be created in order for me to do my job. So my job has associated costs, of course. We have not estimated what those costs are for all of the activities in the plan. Some certainly have cost estimates attached, specific projects associated. Um, others are, are vaguer, you know, they're more ongoing activities that are town functions. And so it would take a pretty significant audit to, to accomplish mm -hmm. that. Yeah, we only have 15 minutes left and we need to get to gas leaks. So one more question and then we'll move on to gas leaks. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just have two clarifying questions. So one is that you're asking for 4,000 for this, right? No, no 2,000. 2, 2, 2, Sorry, that, that was my mistake. Other thing, the, okay, got it. And expression. second clarifying question is um, uh, you're also updating the plan, right? Is that the plan right now is expired and that one no, of the No, the new plan is, has, is printed. We it, have it. The new plan is ready. You're not, you're not, you don't have, okay, got it. That's right. That's Those are the only questions. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. All right. So, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, the memo says 1200. Yep. The backup says 1250. 1250 is the number. 1250 is the number. All right. So, you are maybe the, the first to hear. Um, I'll start this before. Uh, the news that I'll deliver, this, this presentation before the news I'll deliver, but just know that there's a, <laughs> uh, there's a, there's a bit of uh, news ahead. So gas leaks that cause explosions kill trees, degrade human health, and contribute to climate change. The town manager's gas leaks task force has been working since 2016 to find a utility scale solution to national grids leaks, which escape from under town streets. Now, the task force takes its mandate from a priority action identified in the net zero action plan, which is specific to stopping gas leaks. And there's my bit of news. That effort took a big step forward tonight. The select board just passed a resolution calling on national grid to fix 14 of their biggest leaks. National Grid's responsible for these repairs under state law, but they have been delinquent in addressing the issue. They're up against regulatory timelines and uh, in some cases I passed it. So last year, Grid reported that there were 177 leaks in town. That would be Q4 2022. Field observations suggest that number is actually two to three times higher. Um, the natural gas distribution infrastructure in Massachusetts is the second oldest in the country and the most leak prone. Uh, there are leaks next to the high school, major intersections, near daycares, health facilities. And on average, there are multiple leaks per mile of road in Arlington. So, Needless to say, there's a lot of work to be done. I'll be working with the task force on the follow-up to the resolution, but these are just national grid leaks. These are the ones in the infrastructure itself, the utility mains. Residential indoor light leakage isn't tracked in the same way that the utilities are, and we certainly need to pay attention to this problem. There's an estimate that uh, up to 90% of homes using natural gas have indoor leakage. 
there's a big gap in our methane accounting globally that says that we can account for what's being taken out of the ground. We can account for how much the utilities are using or losing rather in terms of leakage, but then we can't account for the rest of the loss that must be out there somewhere. And the working assumption is that that's happening in buildings. So in Arlington, we'll just put this in specific terms. Methane supplied to 12,000 homes, give or take, and 90% of those leaking, we're talking about 10,000 homes, which are very likely to leak. So the Gas Leaks Task Force is seeking 1250 for the purchase of indoor sampling equipment. And this equipment will be used in tandem with a partnership we're discussing with the nonprofit HEAT. Uh, HEAT is the Home Energy Efficiency Team. And their executive director, Dom Nichols, Nicholas, sorry, proposed to us a three-step voluntary program that uh, he would run in partnership and with the task force offered for free to anybody who enrolls. There are three parts of this program, as I said. The first one is air sampling. This is the first step in getting at the indoor leakage problem. The elevated readings inside, if you take a measurement of methane inside a house, very high indicator of leakage. Folks can do this on their own. They can essentially bag the air in their home and ship that off to heat for analysis. Um, easy, safe to do, and really little to no training associated with it. He can then analyze that for the occupant, provide sort of not quite real time, but direct feedback on the air quality indoors in that person's home or apartment. And uh, then we can track sort of in a separate database, the incidence rate of indoor leaks and get an understanding of how many homes are impacted. And the, the instrument that we're looking to purchase would be used in tandem with that survey. So when methane is combusted, it releases nitrous dioxide, a so harmful gas, and it has deleterious health impacts. We're looking to also collect data on the level of nitrous dioxide exposure in homes. So the device is an AeroQual portable air quality monitor. Likewise, it would take air quality samples, but this would be done in partnership with volunteers who would be on site to take the measurements in the home. We store this equipment in my office. It doesn't require any special training or calibration or storage requirements, anything of the likes. It's just a handheld device. It's a little bigger than your smartphone and uh, can be used in many locations. So this would give us a much more holistic sense of the air quality impact resulting from methane and its use. The second stage of the survey, or actually I should say of the study, would be a survey. So if we do register that a building has an elevated level of methane specifically, then we would take a close look at all the infrastructure in the building, look at the, the heat pump, the heater, anything else that uses natural gas and evaluate it for leaks, try to quantify those leaks and then uh, estimate in step three, the daily emissions that are coming from buildings and that frankly we're breathing. So there's a, there's a lot of work being done in this area. Heat is a, is a leader in this space. They have done quite a bit already on uh, the utility scale leaks, and they want to move in the direction of quantifying, assessing, and informing about indoor leaks. Um, they, like I said, developed new methods for that, and those have been likewise celebrated in sort of academic settings and in the press. So this, I think, is an excellent opportunity, a very low cost, to do some community-based science, uh, engage residents in our net zero action plan, think further about the impacts of methane. And you know, 
at its core, much as this is about data gathering and assessing you know, gas leaks, this is a program about the safety and welfare of Farmington residents. And so it's a public health concern that we're looking to address. And we've, in that sense, we've, uh, or in that same vein, we've given thought to the affordability of the fixes for folks. So we have, as uh, part of our net zero action planning, uh, Electrify Arlington, they have coaches who can help folks get electrical appliances. There are coaches willing to take folks through the rebates and so forth. And so anybody who's interested in changing their appliances based on the results of the survey would be able to take advantage of these substantial rebates at this time. So I will add one more thing to that, which is that there is concern about the transition off of gas and that making it more expensive for folks who can't afford to transition their appliances and so forth right now because supply and demand. This would be a proactive approach towards getting folks in the pipeline for, excuse the pun, in the pipeline for affordability well in advance of that shift happening. So we, we shave off the costs of this to the consumer upfront and make sure that folks in Arlington are, are well taken care of in terms of their safety, their welfare, and their wellness. So I'll stop there. Who is, who is actually going to do the testing, a town employee? So the testing can be done by volunteers. He would uh, coordinate. So the town will be buying this piece of equipment and then giving it to a non-town employee organization to go into people's homes, take the tests, and then who's compiling the, the results? Heat or the town? Heat does. And what we, I should back it up and say that in our utility work, we've relied on heat's data in order to make the case that, for example, to the select board for the resolution tonight. So we're looking to them as a partner in this work. I mean, they're already deeply embedded in the gas leaks task forces work. And I, I will also say that the program of doing this monitoring wouldn't exclusively be run by heat. Again, it's a partnership and we would have a role in providing volunteers for that effort. So we would be supplying labor and receiving data. Questions, Topher? Yeah, uh, help me understand this. Um, I know when I'm outside and there's a gas leak, I know it because I smell it. Yeah. My feeling of a gas leak inside a house, um, one that you smell it, and two that your long-term health concerns would be like the least of your problems because <laughs> your house might blow up. You're gonna get that. Yeah. You know, so what 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 am I missing there? What is the? Well, I'll give you the example of my own house. We have a gas heater and gas. Uh, powered water. I'm a renter. And so when the heat kicks on, there are times that I smell methane in my bathroom. And I'm like, this isn't the level of like call national grid, get the emergency authorities out here. This is just like a whiff at a time. And so these things can seem innocuous. You know, they're, they're not necessarily like in your bedroom with methane and you're going to die from no, it. No, but you do smell it. Yeah. No, I was just saying, like, it seems like there's people right. would, unless they have no sense of smell because of COVID, they <laughs> would, uh, right. they would, they would, they would have some advanced warning. No, yes, yeah. certainly. Okay. And then um, that might be the people that would want to have an instrument. Yeah. And can this instrument actually, like, really find like, where it's coming from? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've used it myself. So, like the Geiger um, counter sort of thing yeah. where it just gets. Because that would be, yeah, that's very useful. Yeah, it's a sniffer. It's got a long hose about that long, and the opening is only about as wide as that. So it gets targeted right out to the uh, Okay. Other okay. questions? Grant. Grant. Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, I think the sniffer is kind of like a guy who kind of clicks. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, good endeavor, by the way. I'm always concerned about 
that whole thing with Andover and the gas leaking thing kind of, kind of <laughs> sticks with me. And that was uh, because of an operator or rather than just a casual leak, which I'm kind of hoping this might help address, but um, it doesn't, that's okay. Um, so if leaks are found in the home, um, you got, uh, there's some sort of um, mechanism in place that can you know, help the homeowner fix it themselves. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So in the first place, they can call their uh, service provider. You know, the furnace is leaking. You call your furnace provider, you know, get that fixed straight away. They also have the option of replacing that. So they don't want to see it happen again. They think maybe it's aging out. Maybe it's time for an upgrade, whatever it is. They could switch to an electric one. They get all sorts of benefits from that. And there's the electrify Arlington component that we plug into for that. Okay, it's part two on that. So how is this, there's only one monitor that's available for any homeowner. And how is this program going to be, and only one? You know, is there, yeah. is it cost prohibitive? And also how is that going to be rolled out to make anyone's library system? Or? Yes, essentially. Um, it'll live in my office. So we can have a, a schedule for the use of the monitor. And we can, uh, like I said, work with HEAT on training the volunteers who go out into the community to do it. So they would, they would run that through me, essentially. Oh, may I quick, sorry. Yeah, go so I'm, I'm, I, oh my God, I got a gas leak in my house. I call up your office and your office says, okay, we'll send the volunteer that we have on site or- If you smell it, you call the gas leak. Yeah. Well, yeah. so that's kind of what I'm, so, and then so this monitor is not getting much use. Well, I, mean, I mean, technically, actually, what you're smelling isn't the, isn't the methane, it's the captain. It's the odorizer. The right. captain burns off. If you have, for example, an efficient gas burner or a gas boiler, you're going to get nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide, which is dangerous, but you're never going to smell that. So this would pick up the stuff you can't smell. If you smell the captain, the odor please. Right. Right. The, right. The odorant is so much that you can actually smell it. Yeah. Smell they, even they, they put it in there so you can smell I guess you can't smell the gas from So if somebody says, I don't smell anything, but I'm kind of concerned about this and we go, they'd call your right. office and you would then coordinate with the volunteer and the volunteer would then coordinate with the homeowner and go out and schedule a test. Is that kind of how it would, okay. And yet if these were like available at the library, a person could just call up and say, I'd like to rent this for a week and they could go pick it up as opposed to a consumer doing it. Yes. Is there a lot of training involved with, I mean, I've, no. Uh, Al? No, I'm all set. That was my question. Um, it, uh, Charlie and then Dave. Thank you. Um, so, Grant um, just sort of touched on the, uh, by implication there, and the cost of managing this program. I mean, you, you're a very busy guy, right? And if, if 100 people want to use this, are you going to sit there and take 100 telephone calls? Or do we have to hire somebody? To be answering the phone for this to be a special line. I mean, I'm not being facetious. No, no, no. I'm, I, that's I, it. This I, is a, you this read is my mind. It has a cost. Okay, number one. Yep. Number two, um, I, I I realize I think this heat program uh, is organized with the uh, Boston University, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. And they have a pretty extensive map of all the outside uh, leaks in, in Arlington, among other places, on their website. Um, but you now want to have these people come into an individual's home to measure the gas, right? So who vets these people? How do we know that the person that's coming in, you know, doesn't have a little scam on the side, picking up things out of the house, or maybe uh, is there, a, what do they call it, Corey or Corey? Yeah. Corey, 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 check. Corey check on these people. Oh, I see what you're saying. And, Not that and, they'd be scamming that, the So, you know, but. there's a liability associated and a risk associated for the homeowner having these unknown people come in to do a test when you don't know anything about your background. And then in addition, um, you know, you, you bring in some nice uh, college sophomore and he or she goes in and she's gonna check the, uh, the burner in the basement and falls down the stairs, breaks a leg. Who's got the liability? The homeowner, the town, the heat program? I mean, I, I, candidly, I think this is, there's a lot of holes in this, to be honest. If that, uh, the implementation is not simple. That's my only 
are likely to leak as well. It's it, it's not a matter of age, but older pipes leak more often. So there is every likelihood that a brand new line will leak, for example. That's a possibility. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll, I'll give you an example. Mass Ave and Pleasant, that line was said to have been fixed as part of the MWRA work that's ongoing down there. If you stay on that gas corner, <laughs> On that gas corner. I mean it. You can smell the gas there. I'll call a gas corner at the end of my days. That that's that, that is a really bad leak. It's a major intersection. As I said, we've got 177 of these things in town. There are tons of utility scale leaks that are emitting literally tons of methane, for which all of us are paying as ratepayers. So yes, they're out there doing work. They additionally may be misappropriating the funds from the gas line enhancement program in order to enlarge their lines in order to put more gas through them, which is a major misappro problem. Wait, 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 major maybe problem. misappropriating their funds? The fund, the state funds that are designated to Is someone looking into that? Is something illegal? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the AG was contacted about it. The governor is looking into it. The GSEP program, the gas line, gas system enhancement program, is being researched for, for this. What problem. does that have to do with this? The this right. So thing. I just about to say the request is for twelve hundred and fifty dollars for new equipment. So let's let's focus on for that indoor. budget request for for indoor use through a partnership with a nonprofit for individual homeowners. Sophie, did you have a hand up? I had the same question Charlie had. Okay. Al and then Annie. Yeah, well, I, it's true, 1250 is not much. It, it does worry me a little bit because we bought a number of sound level meters and whatever one was needed, they couldn't find it because they were hardly ever used. But um, let me, I, my question is, am I interpreting this right? This really isn't about looking for pipes that are going to explode and gas leaks. This is more sort of like um, 
analogous to coming in with an infrared camera and looking, this is all the heat you're losing through your walls, so you should probably insulate. So you go into a house where you're not smelling gas, there's no leak, but you have a gas stove and a gas boiler or whatever. You say, this is bad air that's coming into your house. Maybe you should consider using a rebate program to convert. So it's, you know, in other words, I don't think it's really to deal with things like leaks that might explode or whatever, but more to convince people that even in a good house with gas, there's gonna be some pollution that you probably wanna be aware of. That's the case. Okay, is that a fair interpretation? Yeah. Okay. Danny? So if I'm understanding you correctly, this meter measures methane and it also measures nitrous oxide. Just the nitrous lab. oxide is a right. off, uh, uh, off gassing from burning method. So we're measuring two pollutants in the house, both of which have deleterious health effects. And for somebody who's concerned about those things, the ability to meter would be useful. Yes. Thank you. Right. One more question for the night, Peggy. Thank you. Um, so if I'm, start, I'm struggling with understanding the relationship with heat, which I've just learned about tonight, so I know nothing about it. But it, it almost seems like I totally agree with Charlie, the administration of it. I mean, would it make more sense to, to donate $1,250 to him for them to buy this thing and they can administer the, the monitoring and stuff like that? Oh. It, it just seems like we're getting involved with Town is getting involved with the program that I'm not sure the town. Yeah, the town is, is interested in having the data and having this as part of a feeder into the electrifier and campaign. So we would be administering volunteers who would then be coached by electrifier, sorry, homeowners that they are in contact with would then be coached by electrifier on as part of that campaign. Additionally, we receive the information about where the gas leaks occur in residences. So, you know, we have a level of understanding about where the gas leaks occur in the utility lines and the risk to public health and welfare as a result of that. But we don't know in town where buildings are leaking. I mean, I, I stand in my backyard and I can smell my neighbor's house leaking next door. And that's certainly a concern for him, as it should be for anybody with a family or any individual. I mean, it's it's something that we should be looking to remedy as a health and safety concern for our residents. So, um, and, and is he in a position to do that testing? Yes. Yeah, they're, this this is their business essentially. Is so why wouldn't a homeowner, if they smelled gas, they didn't rely on National Grid? Could they call Heat and have ask them to come out and test? Now this this program would be developed in partnership with the town. But I guess what I'm wondering is why don't we have Heat buy this piece of equipment and they take the ownership and the liability and all of that and develop the data for us. We felt like municipal involvement was important so that we had an actual program centered on Arlington. This wouldn't be happening in other municipalities, so we would know specific data about the town. All right, well, it's 1010, we're past the Maragona rules. So um, thank you, David, for thank you. Uh, helping us understand these two additional budget requests. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved, second. Second.